the last session is always bittersweet for me <laughs> because I don't want to leave you. <laughs> I don't want you to leave me, <laughs> whatever. Um, but um, we praise God that we can come together, right? Amen. Yeah. So on this, sec this um, session, I am going to speak about serving God faithfully and considering the great things he has done for us. So I'll be looking at those. Because we see in 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, firstly, it says, only fear the Lord. We covered that. And secondly, and serve him in truth with all your heart. With all your heart. You know, I can't help to think whenever I read a scripture, I always like, it bounces to a different one, and I can't, it's, but it's similar. So I couldn't help to think of, you know, when David, he was instructing his son Solomon in building the temple in First Chronicles. In 28 verse 9, he said, as for you, my son Solomon. And I feel like the Lord could say, as for you, my daughter, fill in, the, fill in your name, right? Know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all the hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts and if you seek him he will be found by you and the amplified reads as for you Solomon my son or as for you fill in your name my daughter know the God of your father have personal knowledge of him be acquainted with and understand him. Appreciate, heed, and cherish him. And serve him with a blameless heart and a willing mind. So the heart and the mind are linked so much together. And it is true that when we're serving the Lord and we're doing what God wants us to do, Satan is going to attack our minds and he is going to try to convince us to stop in some way, shape, or form. Again, we were we have listed four ways. We I'm sorry, I have listed four ways in which we are to serve God, and I listed them off of this verse. The first one is in truth. The second one is wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Thirdly, with our hearts in the right place. And fourth, always. I just put the word always. So number one in truth, number two wholeheartedly as unto him, number three with all our hearts and with our hearts in the right place, and number four always. So number one, we are to serve him in truth. We know John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. You know, the Lord desired that his disciples be set apart in truth, a truth that was in God's word. And in our service to our God, it is of the utmost importance that it be done in truth. As one person noted, and he, I believe, noted very well. I'm going to read what he said. He said, nothing is more important in service than to do it according to the unchangeable truths of the word of God. Service must always be aligned with scripture, and it should never be done in such a way as to violate a known command of God. He goes on to say, in Exodus 32, Moses, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, the people begged Aaron to build them an image that they could use to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings to, an image that they would use as a means by which to serve God. Aaron gave into the wishes of the people, and an idolatrous practice took place, one in which God was not pleased. You see, the people failed to serve God in truth, and the results were devastating. Now, I'm going to add what I want to just touch in on that, and then I'll read the rest of what he said. But truly, that's true. As women in ministry, if you have a ministry you're serving in, you must be led in truth and not be led by what the people in the church want you to do. It may very well align. And it usually does, especially when, you know, like they're really, your heart, their hearts are knit with the vision God's called to your church. 
we all have the same churches we love Jesus but we all have like different the ways in which we minister and do things and and if they are called with the right heart it, 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 it seems like it always aligns right it always confirms but this is a great in Exodus 32 it's a great great instruction for us to observe that we are to do what God is telling us to do concerning serving and then he goes on to say in Judges 17 we read of a similar incident regarding a man named Micah and his mother Micah if you remember stole a large sum of money from his mother and then eventually returned it and the mother said I had wholly dedicated this silver unto the Lord now he goes on to say it sounds good like so often a person's service to the Lord does but note the remainder of her statement she goes on to say, to make a graven image <laughs> and a molten image. You know, Micah's mother was violating God's commandment that no one was to make graven images. So she was not serving the Lord in truth. And I thought those were great examples for, for us to go by. It is essential that we do get the point here. We must serve God as he dictates in his word, according to his word, and that our service be always aligned with scripture service for God and his truth just go hand in hand I always think about how Jesus described Nathaniel do you remember what he said about Nathaniel John 1 verse 47 Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and he said of him here is an Israelite indeed a true descendant of Jacob in whom there is no guile nor deceit, nor duplicity. There is no guile. His heart was clean and pure. And we always must do that, ladies. You know, we need to always take inventory of really what's going on in our hearts as we serve. Because our hearts need to be pure. They need to be right. They need to be without guile, without our own personal game. Now, the NLT of John 147 reads, he's a man of complete integrity. I love that. That's what we always need when we're serving. We are to serve God in truth. And wherever he has us, again, maybe you are a caretaker for your parents, your elderly parents. Maybe you're homeschooling. You're a young mom that seems like all you do is change diapers. You might be the Sunday school teacher or the secretary or the nursery helper or the greeter or the women or the men that serve in the coffee ministry. You might be a woman's prayer leader. You might be a woman's Bible study teacher. You might be a hostess that hosts small groups in your home. You fill in the blank. Whatever you do, you must absolutely do all that you do with integrity and in truth before God. Where God has you right now is where you are to serve him in truth and to just do it faithfully in truth. I want to remind you I put this little note in here, and it's a gentle reminder that our first ministry in which we are to serve the Lord should foremost first be to our husbands and to our children. You know, our love for God and our, you know, our love for God is the top priority, then our husbands and our children. But when you're talking about ministry and serving, that is your first ministry. And if you are not serving in that ministry the way God wants you to, you need to take a step back and reevaluate. I found out, again, a few years back in the early years of our church, um, I just recently found this out a few years ago, that one of my children, and I did not know this at the time, was literally like anxiety ridden and afraid. Now, I wish I would have been told this back then, but I wasn't. <laughs> that I was going to forget to pick him up from Sunday school. And it was because I was so busy talking and ministering to the women, I would, he would have to wait a while, you know, and he'd have, to, he'd have to wait in there. And our Sunday school teachers, oh, how precious are our Sunday school teachers? I mean, a lot of times they're just waiting for parents to pick up their children. I, I say for the love of God, just pick your children up, okay? Pick them up. Okay? <laughs> pick them up for their good, for your good. For the Sunday school teacher's good, pick the children up. And then 
you know, you can minister if you are not neglecting them. I am a firm believer now <laughs> that I made the mistake. <laughs> but I can fully say I'm a firm believer that if you have little children and you're a pastor's wife, you need to pick those children up and possibly leave and go home. They're hungry, they're tired, and you want them to want to come to church. You do not want them to not want to come to church because they're afraid you're going to forget them. <laughs> or it's so long that they're miserable, you know. So, you know, just take heed to that. Um, and for those of you who are called to a teaching ministry, again, we are to only teach the women, not the men, right? And when we serve, we're to serve the women. And if you're doing something different, you need to go to the Word like we did, you know, last night and scripturally find if that's true. That's, that's where it is. So we're to serve him in truth. Secondly, I, I wrote down, we are to serve him wholeheartedly as unto him. That's the key. That is the key in serving wholeheartedly is to serve unto him. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Not for anybody else, but the Lord. Serve with all your heart, and it matters not how little or how much you have to offer. Just serve him. Serve unto him. And in doing so, make sure you're always keeping him the focus in the service. When you serve as unto him, you're never going to feel alone in serving. You're never going to feel frustrated in serving. You're never going to become weary in serving. You're never going to become murmuring in serving. You know, you're not going to grumble and murmur because you're doing it unto him. I've shared this so many times, but I just have to share it again. Um, early when I was a young pastor's wife, and um, I happened to be home with the kids, and Phil was doing work in the house, um, his home office, and um, he... He just asked me if I can grab him a cup of coffee. I was so busy, and I was annoyed. I'm like, well, why can't you get up and get your own cup of coffee? Why do I have to stop everything I'm doing right now and get you coffee? And um, the Lord just pierced me right then in the moment. And he says, if I asked you to get me a cup of coffee, would you do it without being upset? And I was like, oh, my goodness, Lord, of course I would. Serve him the coffee as unto me. So we must do it as unto him. Even when those criticize us in our serving or they don't appreciate us, sometimes that happens. Sometimes we're not. Being, you know, in the church, it's, there's a balance. You don't really want to take people's blessings away from, you know, from them serving by all going all crazy over how wonderful they are in serving. And yet... Servants need to be encouraged, right? So we need to give that encouragement. But sometimes when we're serving, and I know through the years at times, I have felt unappreciated. unappreciated. But that's only when I didn't do it unto the Lord. I was looking around at everybody else. And um, we must always, always do it as unto Jesus. Romans 12, 11 said not to lack, lag in diligence, to be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Thirdly, we are to serve with our hearts in the right place. In Acts 20, verse 19, Paul shared his heart to the Ephesian elders about serving with humility. And even when his trials hit and there were many tears because of those around him. I thought that was interesting. Serving the Lord with all humility. Our hearts must never become prideful in our serving. And we can do it, right? It just, it gear, you know, pride rears its ugly head. It just comes up at a moment when you're not even expecting it. It's like there, you know. So we always have to be very aware of it. But are you serving the Lord with all humility? That is a heart check. Always be checking your heart. Lord, I want to serve in humility. I never want my pride to, to rear its ugly head. Faithful means this. It's defined as this. 
remaining loyal and steadfast. Faithfulness comes from a place of trust and loyalty. Synonyms for faithful are dependable, devoted, dedicated, and constant. Ask yourself, are you dependable in your service to the Lord? Are you devoted in what he's called you to do to serve him? Are you dedicated? Are you constant? It's a good heart check. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep on serving the Lord in whatever manner he is calling you to serve. But we must serve with the right heart, always. And we must keep that check. Our service must be poured forth from the wells of our love that we have toward God. That's where our service it should be the motivating factor is our love for God, and, and that is why we serve. The quality of our service will be tested by fire as we stand before the Bema seat. So we must always continually ask us ourselves, am I serving in the right heart? I don't know about you, but I want to be serving in the right heart. Um, am I doing this for God's glory? or for my own glory. And I think most of us would say, of course I'm doing this for God's glory. But we always must, again, keep that. Those questions should always be in our heart, Lord. I, you know, praying it as you drive to church, praying it as you're serving. Sometimes I have to pray the prayer while I'm serving. Lord, I want my heart to be right in this. I don't want to look to the left or to right. I don't want to look at who's looking at me or what I'm doing. I just want to serve you, Lord. And I want to do it with the right heart. So we must always have the right heart. Number four, we are to serve him always. Always. We are to remain serving him. I mentioned this earlier and I'll mention it again. Satan wants your marriage and if he can break that up, you will no longer be in ministry serving him. In the capacity maybe that you are. Satan wants to take us out And he wants to sow doubt in your head about God's leading in your life. And he wants to discourage you. That's how he plays with your mind. We are to serve with our willing heart and a willing mind. And that's where he gets us. If he can cause you to doubt him and be discouraged in the ministry that God has called you to, he's beginning to tear away at you. And before you know it, you will be out. Don't let it happen. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 5 reads this, Let a man or woman so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of of the mystery of God. You know, I have to sometimes pause when I'm reading scripture and I'm like, whoa. You and I, our husbands, are stewards of the mysteries of God. That's uh, That brings awe to me, you know, that we have this privilege. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, and I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. The Lord is judging us. Therefore, judge nothing before it's time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart then each one's praise will come from God. We are to serve him always and not give up and don't give in and don't be discouraged. God is using each one of you in such a sweet and special way. And how he uses each one of us, you and I, is it can change from time to time, but he is using us. And we are picking away at Satan's darkness as he uses us to serve this amazing, loyal, holy, awesome, faithful God. He wants us out. Don't let him do that. Cry out to God. Go before God. If you have to be on your face before God, 
Don't let him pick away. I love what Amy Carmichael said. She said this, there have been times of late when I have had to hold on to one text, <laughs> scripture, with all my might. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Praise God, it does not say successful. Mm-hmm. Remember that the word does say, well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good, and famous servant. doesn't say that. It doesn't matter if you are ministering to one soul. You may have more blessings in heaven than Billy Graham if you are faithful in ministering to one soul. The Midwest is unique. We don't have churches of thousands and thousands like on the coasts. That's okay. We have exactly who God wants us to have. And we need to do it with all our heart, and we need to do it always, faithfully, steadfastly, being immovable in the service he's called us to. And never despise the days of small things or the years of small things. Don't despise them. Just be blessed. We must, by his grace, remain faithful to him and to what he's calling us to do. We talk about faithfulness and remembering his faithfulness. And I, like Vicki, as I was going over this and meditating on this verse, it was like, it's tr- I can't contain the faithfulness. It's, it's, I, it's from even before I got saved, he was faithful to me and didn't need to be. You know, to now, from big to small to uh, even in heartache, he's, he is always faithful. He is faithful like when Carol said, when the, the ending doesn't end up that great, he's still faithful because he remains faithful. That's who he is. We need to remember his faithfulness. 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Consider what great things he has done for you. And the NLT reads, Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 12, there's a verse that kind of, it just pierced my heart when I was reading it. It says this, it says, The harp and the strings and the tambourine and the flute and wine are in their feasts. But they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Sometimes we fail to consider the operation of his hands in our lives and in our ministries. And we get down and we get depressed or we get discouraged. It's because we lack considering or thinking upon all the things that he has done for us. We must make a habit of thinking and considering. I love Psalm 143 verse 5 because it's, it says three different things <laughs> about remembering faithfulness. Psalm 143 verse 5 says, I remember the days of old. So I remember. That word remember has just been floating through the, con- bless you, but through the conference, you know. It's just, I remember. I remember the days of old. I remember your faithfulness. Secondly, it says, I meditate on all your works. Not an Eastern meditation. You know that. It's thinking upon scripture. And I muse on the work of your hands. And I like, what's, I looked up muse. This is what it said. It says, to become absorbed in thought and to think about something carefully and thoroughly. So not just think flippantly about things, but to really sit before God with your word and your journal and just think about the things he has done for you. I am so about that journal. I'm not a journaler, okay? So I'm not one of those like writey persons, you know? But I do journal scripture and I do journal his faithfulness and I do journal prayers. It's because it just blesses me truly It's a blessing to me to do all that. So I encourage you to do that. 
So we must be absorbed in thought with God's faithfulness. When life is hard, all the more we should be absorbed in God's faithfulness. Elizabeth Elliot said this. She said, sometimes life is so hard, you can only do the next thing. Whatever that is, just do the next thing. God will meet you there. He will meet you there. God will meet you there because he's faithful. He's so faithful. So in doing the next thing, remember his faithful hand upon your life in all the previous years. We must consider his faithfulness, and I jotted down like, I think it's three different things reasons why I mean I'm I'm sure many of you have many you know other things you can add to it but I just for time's sake I journaled three reasons why we need to consider his faithfulness the first one is we I know this sounds like pretty bland but we are simply instructed to do so like seriously throughout scripture it is over and over again instructing us to consider God's faithfulness. And when the Lord instructs us repeatedly to remember something or to do something, we just simply need to do it. <laughs> and when we do, we're so blessed. Again, journaling it, thinking on it, speaking it. We must tell of his faithfulness in our lives to everyone he has placed in our lives, to the ladies in our church, to our children, to our grandchildren, to our friends and co-workers and neighbors, parents, what, to everyone that touches your life, they should hear from your lips and from my lips how faithful God has been to us. I love Psalm 40, verses 8 through 10. I just love the cry of the psalmist's heart, and I feel like it should be the cry of each one of our hearts. It might even, should be maybe a prayer. I love, I love praying scripture too, by the way. You really can't go wrong praying scripture. <laughs> you know, it's just, you can't, you know. But, um, but it says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know I've not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. That goes hand in hand, right? His salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And as women who have been placed by the hand of God in the lives of other women and children, we need to just express the faithfulness of God to them always and pass the baton to them to do so too you know you know the, carol phil and i had the conversation too you know we're getting old i said no we are old you know he said the same thing we're getting old i said no we're all, we, we are old you know it's just it's all to it now and but the thing is is that we are old but any one of us can be taken to heaven and we need to pass the baton now right now to the women in our lives so that when the Lord does take us, the legacy does dribble down. We must always consider his faithfulness because it, are, it encourages, this is number two, it encourages our hearts when things look bleak. Are you heartbroken here today is something in your life looking really bleak really hard really sad and it seems like the situation at hand isn't going to get better one of those situations where you wish the end of your story would be victory and healing and are you sitting here today Remembering his faithfulness in times that look bleak brings blessing to your heart. And I will share with you because it's been a really hard year since November 15th. 
My granddaughter, Lucy, she's two and a half, was diagnosed with a very rare kidney disease. And um, it's been a, a real shaker for us. It's hard to see. It's hard to, you know, to, to have her so sick. Okay. And so she has been hospitalized twice. But basically the situation is she's two and a half. She's on mega steroids. She's on a medicine that's like uh, chemo. It's not chemo, but it's like that. She... Um, has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, acid reflux. So she's on medicines that, like, I should be on because I'm old, right? <laughs> so she's, and she's dealing with it. Well, every, th this is the second time now, you know, they, they put her on extreme steroids and then they try to wean her, hopingly that her kidney will relapse and it'll be great. And then she'll live the rest of her life perfectly fine, right? Well, just... This week, we got news that the second weaning didn't go good. So we're gonna, she's going to be going to Lurie's Children's Hospital. But something that's so ministered to my heart through all this, and because God is faithful, is one day my son was just having an especially really bad day. I mean, it's been really hard. They kind of ha She has no immune system, so no one could be around them. It's just been really hard for my son and his wife. And it was that day that, you know, because she's getting, she has to have blood drawn every two weeks, you know, she's, you know, but it was that particular day she had blood drawn, she had to have an ultrasound, she was having separation anxiety. The steroids, you know, make your emotions go crazy. So she's two and a half and her, her emotions are going crazy, she has no idea why, you know. So it was an extremely rough day and she was crying and crying and crying and crying. And I actually had Bible study that night. I had come home for Bible study and as I was walking in the door, I saw that I missed my son's call. So I called him right up and um, we were talking and he was sharing how hard it was. And he said to me, he goes, you know, mom, my baby Lucy cried so much today that after she fell asleep and I went to kiss her cheek, I tasted the salt from her tears on, on her cheek. And I stopped. And I thought, Lord, that's you. That's you with me. That's you with you. You see, he does taste the salt of your tears. And he does that because he's faithful to us. He is faithful to us. So whatever it is you find yourself in, whatever heartache, whatever bleak situation you're facing, he tastes the salt of your tears. He knows he's there. He's nearer to you now than he'll ever be because he's faithful, and his faithfulness always remains. Philip Keller said in his book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, he says, as Christians, we will sooner or later discover that it is in the valleys of our lives that we find refreshment from God himself. It is not until we have walked with him through some very deep troubles that we discover he can lead us to find our refreshment in him right there in the midst of our difficulty. We are thrilled beyond words when there comes restoration to our souls and spirits from his own gracious spirit. And I was able to tell my son, Bob, do you see how you are crying? Do you see how you taste her tears? He, God's tasting your tears right now. God, God, no, you're, you're heartbroken. God's heartbroken too. He's heartbroken for all of us. He's heartbroken for you. He's faithful. And it's sometimes in those valleys that we experience that all the more. So number three, we must always consider his faithfulness because remembering it reminds us that with every new challenge we face, he's able. He's able. He is so qualified <laughs> to be faithful, you know. I was reminded of this. Just last week, I was running a lot of different errands, and I was out shopping. And I was in the store, and I had a few things in the cart and everything, and the Lord so strongly put it on my heart to leave the store, just to leave, get in my car, go home. And you would think, oh, yeah, right? 
oh, is that me or is the Lord? What's going on here? But I remembered. I remembered his faithfulness. I remembered when I was a young mom, Angela wasn't born yet. I had Philip and Bob. Pastor Phil was working two jobs and doing ministry, and we only had one car. So I was that pastor's wife who literally had, like, a piece of bread. And God provided five meals that week until we got paid. I'm that pastor's wife. <laughs> I've experienced that, and God is faithful. And so, anyway, we had one car, so um, I had driven him to where he needed to be at that point, and I needed a grocery shop at that point. I needed some things, and I had... Um, Bobby was like two and Philly was like four and I had them both in the shopping cart and at the time we had a store named Dominic's that was a real big name store and I was in the Dominic's and I had had my cart pretty full and I was feeling a presence in the store an evil presence in the store and I thought oh that's just me because I had a lot of anxiety back then so I thought it's just me (laughs) and um but then I noticed at the corner of my eye every aisle I went down some this guy was like behind me you know and the Lord put in my heart you need to stroll the cart to the entrance pick up the boys get in the car go home all groceries leave them and so I did I listened to the Lord, put the boys in the car. I was shaky. I knew something was wrong. It was just a discernment. That evening on the news, a, a woman was raped and murdered in that parking lot. You see, ladies, God gives us discernment, right? And I felt so bad that a lady was raped and murdered in that parking lot. But God was faithful for whatever reason to me to give me the discernment that I obeyed. So last week when I was in that store and I was nudged by him to leave, I left. You see, remembering his faithfulness reminds us of every new challenge that we face going before us. He is faithful when we are not. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful He cannot deny himself. Faithful is his name. It defines him. Again, let's, I'm going to read that definition of faithful. It means remaining loyal and steadfast. And that faithfulness comes from a place of trust and loyalty. Synonyms for faithful are dependable, devoted, Dedicated, constant. God is fully dependable. He's fully dependable in the joys in our lives and in the sorrows of our life, in the ups and in the downs, in the ministry and in our personal lives. He is constant. He is devoted. He is never changing. He's a keeper of his promises. He is consistent with all his majesty and power and wisdom to bestow it upon you and I. I, Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by him. I get overwhelmed by him. That he would love me so much. That he would touch me in such a sweet way in, in, in times like that are my hardest, he touches us. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness toward us. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. He is the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for thousands of generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Ladies, I know you love him, and I know you desire to keep his word and what he wants for your life. So in doing so, he is going to be faithful to his promises to you. Don't ever doubt his promises. Has he given you a promise? Has he given you a scripture? Has he given you a word in your heart? Don't doubt it. Go with it. It is faithfulness of his hand upon your life. Revelation 19 verse 11 says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, 
a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful. Uppercase F, that's his name, and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes wars. He is faithful. It defines him. He can't be anything else. Aren't you glad that he's faithful? There are things that we go through within our church um, and within our personal lives that if without him, I don't know how I would do it. Bef like before, I think about before I knew him, I don't know how I'd be standing I think of a time in years past we were talking about how God has always provided for Phil and I in incredible ways in, at points in our lives where you think it's only God getting checks in the mail like that exactly you need for your mortgage I mean things like that just crazy things I remember when we first started the church we had a group of people and we call it um, our learning lessons in ministry because like we it was kind of like uh, they were they were troubled and they were causing trouble and this one gal was very forward assertive and was into the health wealth uh, faith prosperity movement and teaching and she felt it her need to change us Phil and I and we just knew that what she was saying wasn't always doctrinally sound long story short when they left when they left because that will happen ladies people who don't get their way are going to leave they're just going to leave they just you know i mean people who are there to really love and serve and love you and whatever the vision god has given your your husbands and my husband they're going to they're going to stay but people who they want to change you, but because they, they're critical, they're going, it's, they're going to go, and it's really best that they do. So this woman, I remember, now, we were, okay, we, it was hard financially for Phil and I, and, and so she said, and they were big tithers, this, this couple, and, you know, I remember her saying to me at the time, she said, um, I don't know what you guys are going to do. When we leave, you know, my money, our money, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I said, I, I, I just have to say, the first thing that came to my heart was, God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need you or I. And where God guides, right, he provides. Right? God's faithfulness. And he did. He, obviously, we're still standing. It wasn't, we didn't, we didn't close down because she left and didn't get her tithe, Right? And that just recently happened with us a few years ago with a big group of people that left and got back to us the same mindset. They're going to be closed in a year, you know. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I'm not kidding you guys. God is so faithful. He has provided more since they left. But why? Because God doesn't need really us or anyone right? We need to remember his faithfulness. We need to consider what great things he has done for us. I want to read, Great is Thy Faithfulness is probably, it is my very, very favorite hymn. And I just want to read it. And I loved especially that my daughter sang it. <laughs> And it says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me and the next third course goes summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love pardon for sin and peace that endures Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, 
strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings, I love this, all mine with 10,000 <laughs> beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. O oh, our God is faithful. He remains. He restores. He refreshes. He revives. He builds. He, he's there in the midst of anything we're going through. He is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, you are so faithful. Sometimes just saying that, it just doesn't even seem enough to say just that. But Lord, we want to be women who only fear you. We want to be women who serve you with our whole hearts and minds. And we want to be women who always and continually consider the great things that you have done for us. Oh, how we love you. How we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, men in the back. Thank you, Vicki and Carol. <laughs> And I just want to leave you with number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Love you all. It's hard to say farewell, but we'll be back together, either here or there. Yeah. <laughs>